Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce our guest this evening. Nicole Krauss is the best-selling author of the novels Man Walks Into a Room, a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book of the Year, The History of Love, winner of the Saroyan Prize for International Literature, and Great House, a finalist for the National Book Award. Her new book alternates between two distinct stories about two Americans who travel to Tel Aviv searching for something they cannot articulate. A reviewer for The Guardian called the book blazingly intelligent, elegantly written, and a remarkable achievement. Nathan Englander is the author of the novel The Ministry of Special Cases and the story collections for the relief of unbearable urges and what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank winner of the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His new novel is set amid the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It winds together the stories of a prisoner, a guard, mothers, sons, spies, statesmen, traitors, and lovers. A reviewer for the Los Angeles Times calls the book a kaleidoscopic fairy tale of Israeli-Palestinian reconciliation that frames history as both an act and a failure of the imagination, which is to say, in inherently and inescapably human terms. Please first welcome Nicole Krauss to the stage. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here, to be back here tonight. Um, and you heard just a tiny bit about Forrest Stark, and so you already know maybe just the most important bit, which is that it is this novel with two parallel stories, and they alternate. You go back and forth between them, and they are forever crossing the same physical ground, which goes from New York to Tel Aviv, uh, quite literally to the Tel Aviv Hilton, which is on the, on the cover of the book here. You can see it inside, too. And then they kind of explode out into the desert, into the Judean desert in Israel. Um, but they're also constantly crossing, recrossing the same metaphysical ground. Um, and so I'm going to read to you a little from both so you can get a, a feel of who both of these characters are. Um, and the first one, I'm going to read you from the very top of the book. Um, and the first one you're going to hear from or you're going to hear about is a man named Jules Epstein who is 68 years old. He's one of those men who have lived his life absolutely in the sphere of certainties, of total authority, of confidence, of pleasure in the material world. And in the wake of his parents' death, deaths and um, divorcing his wife of many decades, he finds himself in that place that I think a lot of us can find ourselves in no matter what age we're, we're at, which is um, sort of entertaining the question, what if I was wrong about the certainties on which I've staked my life? And in his case, that question of what if I were wrong, what if I neglected something, the neglect has to do with that other realm that isn't the material realm, but is rather the spiritual realm. So here he is. At the time of his disappearance, Epstein had been living in Tel Aviv for three months. No one had seen his apartment. His daughter Lucy had come to visit with her children, but Epstein installed them in the Hilton, where he met them for lavish breakfast, at which he only sipped tea. When Lucy asked to come over, he begged off, explaining that the place was small and modest, not fit for receiving guests. Still reeling from her parents' late divorce, she looked at him through narrow eyes. Nothing about Epstein had previously been small or modest. But despite her suspicion, she'd had to accept it, along with all the other changes that had come over her father. In the end, it was the police detectives who showed Lucy, Jonah, and Maya into their father's apartment, which turned out to be in a crumbling building near the ancient port of Jaffa. The paint was peeling, and the shower let down directly above the toilet. A cockroach strutted majestically across the stone floor. Only after the police detective stomped on it with his shoe did it occur to Maya, Epstein's youngest and most intelligent child, that it may have been the last to see her father. 
if Epstein had ever really lived there at all. The only things that suggested he had inhabited the place were some books warped by the humid air that came through an open window and a bottle of the Coumadin pills he'd taken since the discovery of an atrial fibrillation five years earlier. It could not have been squat called squalid, and yet the place had more in common with the slums of Calcutta than it did with the rooms in which his children had stayed with their father on the Amalfi Coast and capped on Tebe. Though like those other rooms, this one also had a view of the sea. In those final months, Epstein had become difficult to reach. No longer did his answers come hurtling back regardless of the time of day or night. If before he had always had the last word, it was because he'd never not replied. But slowly his messages had become more and more scarce. Time expanded between them because it had expanded in him. The 24 hours he'd once filled with everything under the sun was replaced by a scale of thousands of years. His family and friends became accustomed to his irregular silences, and so when he failed to answer anything at all during the first week of February, no one became instantly alarmed. In the end, it was Maya who woke in the night, feeling a tremor along the invisible line that still connected her to her father, and asked his cousin to check in on him. Madi, who had been the beneficiary of many thousands of dollars from Epstein, caressed the ass of the sleeping lover in his bed, then lit a cigarette and stuffed his bare feet into his shoes, for though it was the middle of the night, he was glad to have a reason to talk to Epstein about a new investment. But when Moti arrived at the Jaffa address scrawled in his palm, he rang Maya back. There must be some mistake, he told her. There was no way her father would live in such a dump. Maya phoned Epstein's lawyer, Schloss, the only one who still knew anything, but he confirmed that the address was correct. The police only had the case for half a day before it was taken over by the Shin Bet. Shimon Paris called the family personally to say that mountains would be moved. The taxi driver who'd picked Epstein up six days earlier was tracked down and taken in for questioning. Scared out of his wits, he smiled the whole time, showing his gold tooth. Later, he led the Shinbet detectives to the road along the Dead Sea, and following some confusion as a result of nerves, managed to locate the spot where he had let Epstein off, an intersection near the barren hills halfway between the caves of Qumran and Ein Gedi. The search parties fanned out across the desert, but all they turned up was M Epstein's empty monogram briefcase, which, as Maya put it, only made the possibility of his transubstantiation seem more real. During those days and nights gathered together in the rooms of the Hilton Suite, his children tossed back and forth between hope and grief. A phone was always ringing. Schloss alone was manning three, and each time it did, they attached themselves to the latest information that came through. Jonah, Lucy, and Maya learned things about their father that they hadn't known. But in the end, they got no closer to finding out what, it had, what he had meant by it all or what had become of him. As the days passed, the calls had come less often and brought no miracles. Slowly, they adjusted themselves to a new reality in which their father, so firm and decisive in life, had left them with a final act that was utterly ambiguous. A rabbi was brought in who explained to them in heavily accented English that Jewish law required absolute certainty about the death before the mourning rituals could be observed. In cases where there was no corpse, a witness to the death was considered enough. And even with no corpse and no witness, a report that the person had been killed by thieves or drowned or dragged off by a wild animal was enough. But in this case, there was no corpse, no witness, and no report. No thieves or wild animals, as far as anyone knew. Only an inscrutable absence where once their father had been. No one could have imagined it, and yet it came to seem like a fitting end. Death was too small for Epstein. In retrospect, not even a real possibility. In life, he had taken up the whole room. He wasn't large, only uncontainable. There was too much of him. He constantly overspilled himself. It all came pouring out, the passion, the anger, the enthusiasm, the contempt for people, and the love for all mankind. 
Argument was the medium in which he was raised, and he needed it to know he was alive. He fell out with three quarters of everyone he had fallen in with. Those that remained could do no wrong and were loved by Epstein forever. To know him was either to be crushed by him or madly inflated. One hardly recognized oneself in his descriptions. He had a long line of protégés. Epstein breathed himself into them. They became larger and larger, as did everyone he chose to love. At last, they flew like a Macy's parade balloon. But then one day, they would snag themselves on Epstein's high moral branches and burst. From then on, their names were anathema. In his inflationary habits, Epstein was deeply American, but in his lack of respect for boundaries and his tribalism, he was not. He was something else, and this something else led to misunderstanding again and again. And yet, he had a way of drawing people in, bringing them over to his side under the expansive umbrella of his policies. He was lit brightly from within, and this light came spilling out of him in the careless fashion of one who hasn't any need to scrimp or save. To be with him was never dull. His spirit swelled and sank and swelled again. His temper flared. He was unforgiving, but he was never less than completely absorbing. He was endlessly curious, and when he became interested in something or someone, his investigations were exhaustive. He never doubted that everyone else would be as interested in these subjects as he was, but few could match his stamina. In the end, it was always his dinner companions who insisted on retiring first, and still Epstein would follow them out of the restaurant, finger stabbing the air, eager to drive home his point. He had always been at the top of everything. Where he lacked natural facilities, by sheer force of will, he drove himself beyond his limits. As a young man, he had not been a natural orator, for example. A lisp had gotten in the way. Nor was he innately athletic. But in time, he came to excel in these especially. The lisp was overcome, and many hours in the gym and the honing of a wily, cutthroat instinct turned him into a champion lightweight wrestler. Where he encountered a wall, he threw himself against it over and over, picking himself up again until one day he went right through it. This enormous pressure and exertion were perceptible in everything he did, and yet what might have come off as striving in anyone else in him seemed a form of grace. Even as a boy, his aspirations were gargantuan. He was going to have endless money because that was his fate. Long before he married into it, he already knew exactly what to do with it. At 13, he bought with his savings a blue silk scarf that he wore as casually as his friends wore their gym sneakers. How many people know what to do with money? His wife, Leanne, had been allergic to her family fortune. It stiffened her and made her quiet. She spent her early years trying to erase her footsteps in the formal gardens. But Epstein taught her what to do with it. He bought a Rubens, a Sargent, a Mort-like tapestry. He hung a small Matisse in his closet. Under a ballerina by Degas, he sat without pants. It wasn't a question of being crude or out of his element. No, Epstein was very polished. He was not refined. He had no wish to lose his impurities, but he had been brought to a high shine. In pleasure, he saw nothing to be ashamed of. His was large and true, and so he could make himself at home among even the most exquisite things. Every summer, he rented the same shabby castle in Granada where the newspaper could be thrown down and the feet put up. He chose a spot in the plaster wall to pencil in the children's growth. In later years, he grew misty-eyed at the mention of the place. He had gotten so much wrong. He had made a mess of it, and yet there, where his children had played freely under the orange trees, he had gotten something right. But at the end, there had been a kind of drift. Later on, when his children looked back and tried to make sense of what had happened, they could pinpoint the beginning of his transformation to the loss of his interest in pleasure. Something opened up between Epstein and his great appetite. It receded beyond the horizon a man carries within himself. Then he lived separately from his purchase of exquisite beauty. He lacked what it took to bring it all into harmony or got tired of the ambition to do so. 
For a while, the paintings still hung on the walls, but he no longer had much to do with them. They carried on their own lives, dreaming in their frames. Something had changed in him. The strong weather of being Epstein no longer gusted outward. A great unnatural stillness settled over everything, as happens before radical events of meteorology. Then the wind shifted and turned inward. It was then that Epstein began to give things away. That's Epstein. <laughs> And now, changing tack. The other character in this book um, is a writer who is suffering, like we all do, writer's block, but that's, in a way, the least interesting thing about her. Um, she is in a moment in her life, which I also think we often find ourselves in, which is feeling that the forms she has chosen for her life, whatever they may be, have grown too small for her that they are, that she is looking for something that allows for a more expansive being. And she's, this part that I'm going to read you, she has, she's been talking for a while about how she has this obsession with setting this novel at the Tel Aviv Hilton, that same building that I showed you, um, or somehow using that crazy, imposing, grid-like building as some cue to some structure of a novel that she can't imagine writing. But it's not because that architecture is so imposing and so guiding, but just the opposite. It's that to her, that building in her past, which you're, she's going to tell you about, is associated almost with experiences that feel nearly mystical. So that building for her in her life is almost a kind of portal to the possibility of other worlds, or certainly otherworldliness. To begin with, I was conceived there. In the wake of the Yom Kippur War, three years after my parents were married in high winds on the Hilton's terrace, they were occupying a room on the hotel's 16th floor when the unique conditions that were the prerequisites for my existence suddenly aligned. With only the foggiest sense of the consequences, my mother and father instinctively acted on them. I was born in Beth Israel Hospital in New York City. But less than a year later, swimming upstream, my parents brought me back to the Tel Aviv Hilton. And from then on, almost every year, I've returned to that hotel perched on a hill between Higher Cone Street and the Mediterranean Sea. But if the place has a kind of mystical aura for me, it isn't only because life began for me there, or that later I spent so many vacations at the hotel. It's also the spine-tingling nature of something that once happened to me there, an experience that only increased my awareness of an opening, a small tear in the fabric of reality. It occurred in the hotel swimming pool when I was seven. I spent a lot of time in that pool, which was set on a large terrace overlooking the sea and fed by its salt water. The year before, our visit had overlapped with Yitzhak Perlman's, and one morning after breakfast, we came out and found him parked by the deep end, throwing a ball to his children, who took turns leaping into the pool, trying to catch it. The sight of the great violinist in his glinting wheelchair, along with the murky awareness that the polio that had crippled him had something to do with swimming pools, terrified me. The next day I refused to go down to the pool altogether, and the day after that we left Israel and flew back to New York. The following year I returned to the hotel with a feeling of unease, but Perlman didn't reappear. Furthermore, on the first day back, my brother and I discovered that the pool was full of money. Shekels everywhere, shimmering mutely on the floor of the pool as if the drain were hooked up to Ben Kapaolim. Whatever lingering fears I had about swimming were shunted aside by the steady flow of cash we could turn up. As in any well-run operation, we soon divided and specialized. My brother, two years older, became the diver, and I, with a smaller lung capacity and keener eyes, became the spotter. At my direction, he would plunge down and grope around at the blurry bottom. 
If I had been right, as I was about 65% of the time, he would burst excitedly to the surface, clutching the coin. One afternoon, after a string of false calls, I began to feel desperate. The day was wearing on, and our time in the pool was almost up. My brother was wading morose along the wall of the shallow end. I couldn't help myself, and from the middle of the pool, I shouted, There! I was lying. I'd seen nothing, but I couldn't resist the chance to make my brother happy again. He came splashing toward me. Right there, I yelled. He went below. I knew there was nothing at the bottom, and now, treading water at the top, I waited miserably for my brother to find out, too. The crushing guilt I felt in those few moments comes vividly back even more than 30 years later. It was one thing to lie to my parents, but to so blatantly betray my brother was something else again. As for what happened next, I have no explanation for it, or none beyond the possibility that the laws we cling to in order to assure ourselves that all is as it seems have occluded a more complex view of the universe, one that forgoes the comfort of squeezing the world to fit the limited reach of our comprehension. Otherwise, how else to explain that my brother surfaced and uncurled his fingers, lying in his palm was an earring with three diamonds, and beneath them, hanging from a gold hoop, loop at the bottom, a ruby heart. In dripping bathing suits, we followed our mother through the frigid, air-conditioned hallways of the hotel to the H. Stearns in the lobby. She explained the situation to the balding jeweler who looked at us dubiously as he pushed a tray lined with blue velvet across the glass countertop. My mother laid the earring down and the jeweler fit the loop to his eye. He studied our treasure. When he lifted his head at last, his giant, magnified eye swiveled over us. Real, he pronounced. The gold is 18 carat. Real. The word catches in the throat and won't go down. It never occurred to me that the earring might be fake in the way my mother had suspected it was. And yet only I knew just how unreal it really was, how against the odds was my brother's discovery of it, how it had materialized in answer to a need. No young child naturally believes that reality is firm. To her, its springs are loose. It is open to her special pleading but slowly she is taught to believe otherwise, and by then I was seven, old enough to have mostly come around to accepting that reality was fixed and utterly indifferent to my longings. Now, at the last minute, a foot was put in the way of a door closing. Thank you. It's just, uh, it's an honor to be back here and so nice and a double honor to share the stage with a friend whose work I so admire, which she knows because I've said that in front of her from other stages. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, the books come and we get out. This is my first tour with reading glasses. Anyway. Um, how it had come to this, prisoner Z felt, had been set so very early, his Jerusalem, his Israel, his end. He'd been given it so long ago back in suburbia, back in America, a birthright spoon-fed to him in his Jewish day school classroom, a little boy with a heavy prayer book and a yarmulke like a soup bowl turned over and resting atop his head. It is second grade and they are running, the children with their arms outspread, they are flying, the desks are pushed together, the teachers order their lovely 18-year-old teacher who would soon get pregnant and disappear. They know enough, the boys and girls, to love this black-haired lady who's even more black, more beautiful hair peeks out from under her wig as she pushes the big desk, the teacher's desk, toward theirs. She dresses modestly, but there is no modest when you are a beautiful, raven-haired, 18-year-old second-grade teacher, flushed from trying to get pregnant in all your free time. <laughs> Their love for her was different from what they felt for the others. It was marrying love and wanting to be her love, and it was youthful, energetic teacher love, and they would do anything for her, anything at all. 
So when after morning prayer, after marching into the room with their big green sedurum and taking their seats, when she'd stood and jutted out her bottom jaw and blown the hair from her eyes, when she'd said, up, up, and raised her hands, raising the class so easily with them, Prisoner Z is no longer sure if she'd actually spoken the up, up at all. We are going somewhere and we are late, is what she says. Where are we going, asks Bacha, whose English name is Beth. A smile from the teacher, a glimmer to the eye. We are going, my little Yiddelach, to Yerushalayim. We are flying right now to Israel. The Mashiach is coming and we need to get there. We need to help welcome him in. And the hands again are waving and we are all already following. Now push, push the desk together so we can get up into the sky. And when those desks are all together, a circle around the room, the teacher takes one of our tiny chairs, raising her skirt so we can see her ankles swathed and her scratchy gray tights. She places a foot on the seat of that chair and then climbs onto those child-sized desks. A teacher, a teacher standing on a desk. It is glorious. She bends a bit at the knees and leans her head forward. The teacher then spreads her arms wide. She says, I am on an airplane. I am an airplane. We are all flying to Israel together to make Aliyah. We are headed to Jerusalem. We must hurry, hurry, a long flight, and the Messiah already on his way. And she takes off like that, flying from desk to desk around the room, tilting her beautiful covered arms on the turns. Come, she says, come. You do not want to be left in Golos, forgotten in this Egypt when the Messiah comes, our country awaits. And it is Roly Poly Bensi who is first up, and then Mayor Arye follows, flashing his monkey grin. There are Devorah and Yocheved, Susan and Zev, and then I am on the chair. Prisoner Z feels himself rising. But with all those arms tilting and everyone running and howling and flying, I'm too afraid to join. And suddenly I am grabbed, and suddenly I am lifted. The teacher has got me, she is holding me, and she sets me down in motion, and that is love, and that is care. She holds on until my feet are moving and my arms are spreading, until I too, I feel it, until I am looking down at the classroom below, down at New York, at America, until it all looks like desert and all looks like wasteland, nothing but the emptiness that is the whole world outside what God gave us. Um, It was 1996, uh, and peace was breaking out in the Middle East. Uh, I was living in Iowa City, Iowa, and I was desperate to be a part of it. Uh, It was really happening, and my friends were already there, and honestly, I was afraid of missing out. I'm like, people are going to be holding hands from Tel Aviv to Baghdad. You know, Israel already had peace with Egypt. There was peace with Jordan. Uh, The Palestinians had the West Bank and a casino, like they were an inch away from a state. And again, I'm on the move. I get my degree, I fly to New York, I kiss me mom. Uh, and you know, I'm also not just moving there, by the way, as someone who grew up uh, very religious and is now very secular, I'm making Aliyah, which is you know, la lot, to go up. The idea, it's a holy thing, you're going up, it's a forever thing. Uh, and you know, the way I see it is my friend around then got it, was getting a job in Denver, and he didn't call me and say like, uh, yeah, hey, I'm moving to Denver, and I will die in Denver, and the sands of Denver will drink my blood. You know, he's just like, we'll see how it goes. I found a place. Anyway, but I get on the plane, uh, you know, I fly, wake up in Tel Aviv, uh, you know, get off, you could still kiss the ground then, it was still outside, no fountain. Anyway, but I walk in and uh, look for the first official looking Jew I could find, uh, and I say to him, I say, "Uh, excuse me, I'm looking for the office uh, for new immigrants. And he says to me, did you come on the plane from Manhattan? You know, not America, not even New York, Manhattan, like we have our own fucking airstrip on Broadway. Um, Anyway, and I say, yes, yes, I did. Uh, And he says, it's not too late, go back. (laughs) But I don't go back. Uh, I get settled in and I spent a year there and some summers and I'm hooked up and it's like two days later and I'm in the, you know, German colony in the fancy American bubble and the fancy professors, you know, old Arab house and we're having Shabbos dinner and, you know, I'm going to be welcomed and I'm convinced I'm going to be welcomed because I'm also at this time, I'm pretty sure the peace process, the missing link is, you know, a semi-stone, long-haired, unpublished short story writer. I'm like, this is... (laughs) just what they need. But, you know, and it's, again, the fancy people and architect of the Oslo Accords is there, and uh, she raises up her glass. I'm like, I'm going to get my toast. And she says, welcome to the Titanic. 
Yeah, uh, and I understand it because it was, you know, there were complications, like buses were blowing up, the prime minister had been assassinated, that's true, but I can't even tell you, or I am telling you, it felt so good on the street. You know what I'm saying? Back to majorities, back to populations, back to real people, it felt really good. You know, and on Saturday, on Shabbat, we'd go to East Jerusalem and we'd go eat at the Arab restaurants and it was, you know, Jews and Palestinians together. You know, I remember seeing like the head of the Israeli news and one of the big wigs from the PLO and all of us and the kids playing and it was just lively and warm and I'm like, we're really, really going to make this happen. But I don't want to make it happen as an expat American because it's, this is history. I want to do it as an Israeli. I don't want to live in that bubble community. Like there's a neighborhood in the center of town, all twisty alleyways and houses piled on top of each other they're tilting over and it's like the old Bukharian women and the stone messianists and you know the freaks and the artists and it was the birth then my friend I'm like I'm going to be a writer he's like I'm, he's a very big rapper now but it was the birth then of Hebrew rap which I still love anyway but uh yeah that was the neighborhood and it was you know really tumbled down I mean my apartment patched with tin and chicken wire and when it would rain I still remember the rain like running down the walls and running under the doors and my roommate Joel and I would sit there and there was a Susie was, she's here, she was at that apartment. There was a light bulb hanging on a wire and the rain would just pour off. We just watched it pour. You know, it was really a mess. And what sums it up is uh, my friend's story. He was in a very loving relationship, a uh, monogamous long-term relationship. And he wakes up one morning and he has a terrible venereal disease. When he pees, his penis is on fire. Like his eyes are bugging out, his teeth are chattering, his fingers are curling. It's terrible. I'm sure we have a doctor to hear. Uh, the non-complication, when he poops and pees, totally fine. Pees, again, teeth chattering, like terrible. Something's, fingers hurt, like his whole body's curling into itself. Poops and pees, fine. It goes on like that, and then we get the uh, diagnosis, which is that uh, his landlord um, had not grounded the electricity. When he's sitting down, he's peeing against porcelain. <laughs> when he's standing up, he was closing the circuit and being electrocuted. <laughs> through his penis. But um, that is literally, literally the least of our problems. We had stuff like that all the time. Um, and I did get my electricity grounded after that, by the way. I also learned why all our houses smelled. I learned what an elbow joint was, why you have a trap in your separate. We learned a lot there. But again, this was our crazy neighborhood. And another thing we loved about this neighborhood is like Machane Yehuda, the open air market, was like two blocks away. It's just a minute. Not even my bachelor self and my empty fridge that I kept forever, but like it was just fun. You need a cucumber, you get a cucumber. You need to make, I'd buy like pistachios one at a time. Like walk there, walk back, walk there, walk back. Anyway, so. You know, one Friday, I'm there with my Israeli girlfriend, my buddy, Mike's, my buddy Mike's down from Haifa, and we go do our shopping, get our hummus, our pita, and as always, it's always a beautiful day in Israel, and we're like, should we do a big shopping? And we're like, let's just go home. And we get back to the balcony, and we start unpacking, and then we hear a boom, and another boom, and the market has just blown up. Now, I'm a coward and a suburban boy and terrified of everything, and I really want to lose it. I really want to freak out. But my Israeli girlfriend is going to make a man out of me. She's going to teach me how to be an Israeli boy. And she says, when your number's up, your number's up. And I think about that. And you know what? Like, I get it. They don't do chaos theory there. Like, you did not survive September 11th in Minnesota, and you didn't survive it in the Bronx. You know what I'm saying? In Israel, if you're close enough to claim something, you're dead. Them's the rules. And you know what? I wasn't afraid then because we were making something bigger. Like, I believe in peace. Like, the things that we sacrifice 30,000 people a year for guns in this country, I can't even talk about it. It makes me so ill. But that notion, like, you know what I'm saying? That we're making peace and there are enemies of peace. And if you're going to die for it, I was like, I was really willing to die for it. So I bucked up and I said, if your number's up, your number's up. And I went on like that. And not long after, I'm sitting at my coffee shop, a straight walk, you know, down the block from my house, Kikar Tzion, Zion Square, and I'm doing my writing, and I finish up for the day, and I'm ready to go home, but I'm sure we have some writers here, I already met one, but like, I was like, 15 more minutes, another comma, another word, another half idea, you can do it, so I put in another 15 minutes, and I pack up my thing, and I'm about to leave, and then I hear a boom, but this time, I've heard that before, so when I hear the second boom, and the third boom, it is the worst thing I've ever heard in my life, because I know I'm listening to people get dead, and it is just 
animal and primal and horrible and the smoke off it and the people running and I couldn't even remember my phone number. I was just erased to call anything and there's nothing to do for an American kid, you know, one story up in the coffee shop on the corner. There's just, you know, the police are already there. It's Israel. It's a machine. The paramedics, like there's nothing for you to do except go home. So I walk to that corner that I walk up and down every day and I make maybe my first non-Israeli decision, which I decide it's not going to help anyone for me to see the bodies or me to see the body parts or the blood. I just don't need those memories. And I take another route to walk home. But the next day, I'm back there eating a slice, triangular American slice of pizza right in the blast zone. I'm Ben Yehuda. The blood's washed away. The glass, it's Israel. It's all cleaned up. You know what I'm saying? The cash machine needs some fixing. You know, maybe some things are bordered, but it's already getting cleaned and fixed. And there's not a sign. And I'm there because Joel's made me go there because if I don't go back the next day, I'm not going to go back the day after that and the day after that. It's about continuity and it's about moving ahead. And you know what? At this point, I'm starting to think, uh, you know, like Chekhov's word six, like maybe everyone here walking around like everything's normal and saying like we're okay and we're sane and everything, like maybe normality is really abnormal. Like I'm starting to think we should all be curled up into a ball freaking out that we should lose it. But then again, there is the peace and we're working towards something and I try and remind myself that that is what we're doing. That's how we're going to go on. And what I hold on to then and it's super vulnerable making to me, is uh, I think about it literally at the, since like the dawn of humanity. Uh, it's really maybe the stupidest thing that all people I believe have shared, which is, you know, this wanting to go to the moon. You know what I'm saying? Nobody wants to touch the sun. We figured out that's hot. But anyway, but the moon, everyone like from the dawn of time, everybody wanted to reach the moon. And back to us having like the worst kind of competitions now, whether it's nuclear buildup or nonsense, like what a great nonsense goal for us to fight with Russia with. Like who can touch the moon first, you know? But to me, all this money, all this energy, all this brain power, we put all our energy together and we sent a man to the moon and for me, like the far bigger miracle of it, like getting someone to the moon is a, impossible, but it's like we brought them back, you know? And I was like, if we can do that, I would really grab onto it. If we can do that, we can make peace. And also, we are one signature away. It's happening. Like Sharm el Sheikh, just a signature, one person's signature, it's done. Everyone knows the maps, everyone knows everything. And if you can also go back to that time, you know, it's. Bill Clinton is president. America has a surplus. We're still a democracy. We have a respected president that other leaders trust and understand his good. It's like a giant thing, that kind of goodwill that we were using then on this project. And it's also the year 2000. You know, I'm in Jerusalem, uh, Jesus' hometown, and it's like 2000 was so big. And, you know, remember Y2K? We survived Y2K. We're like, this is a bright new dawning age. There was really, I didn't get my Jensen's hovercraft, but we got, you know, but there we really believe it was like 2,000 things can be done and then it was Rosh Hashanah that year so I was like it's a double up it's like you know 2,000 he's also Jewish but nonetheless 2,000 years from Jesus and like Jewish New Year and we're like this is our year you know what I'm saying? We're going to make it happen. It's right there. And I have friends over for Rosh Hashanah dinner. And again, back to the bachelor self, you know, potluck. But nonetheless, we have a great time. Everyone brings food. Again, to really date it, this is maybe the most embarrassing part of the whole uh, story. I remember we were smoking cigars. God help us. But nonetheless, we had this like lovely night. And we're like, you know, it was just bright and a bright new year starting. And we go to sleep. And then we wake up and the country is on fire. You know what I'm saying? We are at war. Intifada 2 has started, and it is more violent and more intense than I could have imagined, and we're just burning everything down. Like, both sides just want to see it all go away, mutually assured destruction. And I call my friend Debbie, uh, and she's a war photographer, so she makes her money on days like that, and she answers the phone, and I can hear, you know, the sound of, like, the bullets flying and the, you know, shot grenade kind of stuff, the tear get, like, I can hear the sounds of war through the phone. And I say to her, uh, Debbie, last night, uh, do you think Shelly had a good time? Um, and she still teases me mercilessly about this because she doesn't hang up the phone. 
You know what I'm saying? I'm a neurotic and we all have our priorities. She like, you know those giant cement things? She like goes behind one of those giant cement things you see on TV and drops down with her phone and we literally go through it. Like, you know, is it okay that Kathy and Kobe came from Tel Aviv? Like, was the dessert all right? You know, we go through it all because we're going to continue. We're going to have a normal life and that's the normal, abnormal life we have after then. It's just already a militarized city, but you know, the guns that are everywhere are now really on every corner and I look out my window and see the tanks getting driven by on flatbeds to be delivered to the front, which is a couple of miles away. And at night, I can see those Cobra attack helicopters just fly out and literally just, it's much prettier in the movies, just go black and disappear. And I was like, if you're gonna, you know, write your novel and the, you know, your windows are shaking from that tank fire, you put your earplugs in and you write your novel. You know, I remember watching a Die Hard in my living room. We had speakers then too, not just the phone. But I remember like surround sound. It's like, that was weird. I remember pausing the movie and opening the door and it was the machine gun fire just bouncing off the hills and into my apartment. But at this point, I am afraid because at this point, before it was dying for something, and now I understand Sharon sucks, and Arafat sucks, and just nobody's trying, and I was like, this death is all for nothing. And I'm already a writer by then, and I'm you know, flying around, and I'm coming back to Israel on empty planes. You know What it is to fly back, I'm like, nobody wants to come to my country, nobody in my country wants to come to Jerusalem, and nobody in Jerusalem wants to come to my neighborhood. You know, I'd be sitting there, I remember with Joe in a big empty restaurant, just me, him, and a waiter, You know, just like proving we could go there to eat in the shook with the shook guys because we're the shook people and we're going to eat hummus in the market literally if it kills us and I'm so hopeless now and I'm looking for that you know man on the moon feeling and I'm looking for that aliyah going up feeling and I'm just really hopeless and looking for something to grab onto and what I get is a Hebrew University I start driving up the mountain every day to Mount Scopus because I want you to know like really if anything, universities are all about hope. Nobody's doing anything at the university for the university. You know what I'm saying? If you're studying there, it's to do something else. It's to move ahead. It's to have a bright future. And that idea of you know, everyone together, Jew and Arab, you know, religious and secular, everyone working towards something else and also working really hard to have sex, like those two wonderful ideals of university life, literally, that, when I was most hopeless, is what I grabbed onto uh, for hope. Z tells her about those sweet and pure years in Jerusalem, the peace process years. He tells the waitress how wonderful it felt to live there, even with the terror that darkened so many days. He shares with her his memories of what it was like to be the new immigrant, what it meant for him to make do while he was broken, alone, and yet always exhilarated by that ancient city. He was so busy then, becoming fluent in Hebrew, getting himself educated, and embarking on a career that quickly turned into a secret other. When he had had his Hebrew to study and his schoolwork to do, he would always take the bus up the mountain, even if his classes had been down on Givat Ram. He'd hop off at the last stop and file past security, pausing for inspection by one of the old men, and they were always old, whose investigations consisted of pressing their fingers to the bottom of his book bag, as if checking to see if it was ripe. Z would settle into the library's fourth floor, feeling himself cocooned in a vision of Israel's brightest possible future. That's what he was trying to express to the waitress, how for him, for his dreams of what Israel might become, Mount Scopus summed it up. Crammed together at those study tables were religious and secular, Arab and Jew, rich and poor, white and brown, and sometimes black. The societal groupings based on subject and course, the focus of the students, as with all universities, the universe over, resting on the twin pillars of learning and getting laid. That campus was a place of sex and study, a refuge from the attended politics and attended hatreds that constantly rattled the state. It was as if all that noise was filtered out and what was left was just pure hope. They were up on that mountain waiting for the inevitable harmony to set in, a promised change that had literally drawn Z from America. He had moved to Israel to contribute to that happy age. He had rushed his aliyah, transferring to Hebrew University in the middle of his graduate degree because he was afraid if he stayed in America any longer, he'd miss it. He was afraid peace would start without him. Z admits in response to the waitress's question that of course there were the junior politicians and student government and the junior idiots and crackpots on campus who would one day likewise see their professional idiocies and crackpotitudes blossom. But the overarching dominant goodness and happy idealism of the place easily drowned them out. 
Nothing better demonstrated the unique normality of that oasis than the unstated policy that one could leave one's bag on a table and, for a few moments, walk away. Really, outside the university, Z could think of no other place in the whole country where a bag left unattended wouldn't have the first person to spot it yelling out without hesitation, the bomb squad summon a cordon immediately thrown. So often and frequently did this happen that whenever anyone was late to a dinner or a drink, all they need say was suspicious object, everyone's permanent, eternally reusable excuse. Z always remembers the face of a businessman running back to f fetch his forgotten briefcase just in time to see the sapper set it off, all his papers swirling down onto the sidewalk after being blasted into the air. But on campus, no one expected you to drag all your books from your favorite carol to run out for a coffee or a smoke or a quick pee. When Z was hungry, which in those days in his slightly younger man's body, he always ravenously was. He'd wend through the absurdly Byzantine main building and make his way across the donor named Nancy Reagan Plaza to the Frank Sinatra cafeteria, which served, as far as he was concerned, the best schnitzel in town. Every school day for countless school days, he ate the same thing, a colossal state-subsidized plate of schnitzel, rice, and gravy. A meal served to him by a kitchen staff that was a mix of Israelis from West Jerusalem and Palestinians from the neighboring village. Z felt warmly toward all of them. It was the kind of fondness fostered by loyalty and routine and the nurturing inherent in being cared for. Answering another question from the waitress, one punctuated by a guffaw, Z admits that, yes, he falls easily in love with anyone who feeds him, and that when he finds a lunch he likes, he does indeed eat it every day. He also admits that he is telling the story this way because he really wants her to grasp how important and special that place was to him and how singular its character because he wants her to understand how perfectly, evilly perfect it was to blow it up. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is my first time hearing Nicole Krauss. Uh, I can't get over your talent and craftsmanship, and I've sort of followed Nathan Englander around, so I've uh, seen some settling down. Uh, but <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, but uh, what I, I really uh, like to uh, ask uh, each of you is uh, to describe your writing process from how characters come to you uh, to how you decide to structure your novels. And that's a question to both of you. Thank you. You want to start? I'm, I'm happy to, unless you want to. Go ahead. This will turn into a cycle of, a Kafka cycle of politeness that will take, <laughs> it'll be midnight. You sure? Yes, please. Oh. Uh, thanks for your nice question. Uh, yeah, I, I, I say, I'm always like, scream out a tragedy and I'll make a joke. I try to be cynical about everything in life, but writing is so deeply sincere for me. I don't even know what to tell you. I've wanted to write this book for near 20 years. Easily, you know, again, the end of the peace process, like 17 long years, I really wanted to uh, attach to the subject. And I was like, nobody needs a diatribe. You know, that's what I'd love to talk about in the cult. But like, it's a huge subject. Nobody wants a lecture. And I was like, it has to be story driven. It has to be character driven. And I have those diatribes for you, which I will not share. You know what I'm saying? I, know, I was, my wife was getting her two things. My wife was getting a grant. We were out in Madison, Wisconsin. And that's it, just write every day. And then I was just sitting there, and there's a character. I was reading a little about Prisoner Z, who's a, you know, American Jew, much like me, who turns into a spy and then a traitor. But there's like a general character who's sort of, uh, you know, a, one doesn't say inspired by Ariel Sharon, but point is there's like, that's at my jumping off point. And yeah, I was just sitting there in my room and suddenly I was typing this woman, you know, Ruthie, his caregiver. I just suddenly was typing about Ruthie sitting next to the general in my character's bed, just typing the scene. And I was like, those are those bizarre moments where you're, I can't tell you how much this is a subconscious based process like that. I must've been working on that. It's bizarre even to me. And back to structure, I'll do in like two lines, but I studied with, Marilyn Robinson when I was out at Iowa when I was, you know, 24 and newly secular and all that stuff. And she taught me, like, I had my first teacher. But I'd say, you know, I'd write a sentence. I should wait here all day for you to show up at 5.30 when we said we'd meet at 3 o'clock. That's a friend. You know, and she's like, you, that, that is a sentence. It's just backwards, you know. <laughs> so she taught me to 
she taught me that I wrote my sentences in circles, and uh, you saying back to me trying to be linear now on stage, but I think in circles, and uh, you know, writing is communication. You know what I'm saying? Like, you hear, I know these people as soon as I hear about them, and uh, uh, basically, I thought for, you know, it's my fourth book, I was finally ready. I spent my whole career, you know, keeping control of those circles, but I was like, the Israel story is a heartbreaking cycle of, again, you know what I'm saying, there's another Gaza war, the, everything's torn down, then it's rebuilt, then it's quiet, like right now Hamas is preparing, right now Israel's preparing, again and again I thought, oh, the story needs the circles, and I finally get to keep my circles, and that's how I made a round structure. <laughs> Um, well, for me, usually novels begin with some moment that feels utterly alive to me, and that takes a long time to come to. So there'll be a lot of writing and dead ends until finally something happens, and it's almost like the mortal breath is blown into a character, and then they're just absolutely alive on the page. And I know that they, they can house my concerns and my urgent questions for however many years I'm going to be living with them. Um, in this case, some of those concerns had to do with a sort of growing feeling that we are living in a world where we so entirely value the known and, and, and certainties, and we rely on them because, of course, they give us stability, which we want. They give us coherence, which we know the brain needs above all else, right? Anyone who's read Oliver Sacks or any kind of neurologist or neuroscientist knows that no matter how damaged the brain is, it will find some shape, form of coherence. We want all of those things. We want the comfort of laying our hands on keys and going into Google and knowing all of the known world is accessible to us. And somebody, you know, somebody somewhere knows it, and so that's comforting. But increasingly, that means we're turning away from the unknown. And when I think of the unknown, I think of wonder and awe. And I think of that kind of sense of that which we turn to, which, you know, if we allow the unknown to flood into us, we're altered, you know, we change. But it's, it's difficult, it's, you know, it fills us with fear. And so we'd rather think of the unknown as kind of ignorance, you know. We started to think about that, and I started to think about a lot, um, you know, when you're a writer, you spend every day going into your workroom, and you're aware of this possibility in writing, and I think you'll be aware of it as a reader, too, that when you tell stories or read stories, when you throw yourself into a character and become something else, become the other, become the unknown thing, but also fill it with your own experience, and you grow. You know, like one life is not enough. We need lots of life, and we, we need the narrative to expand, the narrative of the self to expand. And we feel at times that sometimes whatever narrative or whatever form we've chosen for our life, it's too small. But we don't often know how to break it open. And in my work as a writer, I saw every day as writers and readers, we break it open. And why don't we return that sense? You know, why don't we go back out of the writing room or out of the books into the story of our own, our own lives with that sense of the possibility of expan the expansion of the narrative of the self, of what we think of as the laws of reality that govern us, which we know are actually just kind of fictions that we collectively agree to believe in. So all of, all of that was important to me early on in this book um, and kind of flooded into those characters, that those two characters that stood up from the rest and became live. And then finally about structure. I, I really believe that novels are searching vehicles. They're not, they're not things that deliver answers. They pose questions. And as such, when I set out to write one, I don't have answers. I just have questions. And I'm aware of the fact that I'm going to dwell for a very long period in that unknown. I mean, it's what Keats called you know, the uncertainty principle, that sense of just dwelling in uncertainty. And it's very uncomfortable as a writer. It's very uncomfortable as people to, you know, to be in uncertainty. But what I found is that time and time again, though I don't know where I'm going in the novel, accidents happen. I follow my intuition, and I arrive at places of discovery and occasionally even revelation that I just never otherwise would have gotten to. So the process is totally organic and, and intuitive, and every page is written kind of in the order that you read it. Um, and, and for me, it is, it is the only way to do it. It is an unnerving way to do it. But it, I've been doing it for 15 years now, and I think at last I've found some pleasure in that. I have um, two questions. Um, number one, do you like the people that 
are your characters? Do you have to like them? And my second one is, um, do you physically go to the places that you describe in your books? Hmm. I guess to both of you. Should I start with that one? Sure. Okay. Um, it's, it's a really interesting question about the likability. It's one I've thought about a lot because when I wrote, for example, The History of Love, I wrote characters like Leo Gursky or Alma Singer who were just absolutely, the moment you meet them, they sort of are, they fill you with feeling, they charm you, or the book isn't for you. You know what I mean? Like the moment, that, the moment you meet them, you love them, or, or it isn't for you. And that was interesting and beautiful, but after a while, I also started to think about how the, just the nature of empathy, you know, this is really at the core of literature, right? What it is to, as we said, this literature gives you this one chance that I don't think you can find anywhere else in life, and I've looked for it everywhere, to step absolutely and intimately into another person's being and feel what it is to be him or her. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought, well, I'd like to do that with somebody who's not so obviously likable because the empathy is harder. The empathy takes more time. And so over time, I sort of deliberately allowed myself to let go of that, to let go of likability and write characters that are difficult and harder and complex and sometimes angry and sometimes violent and but tender also and thoughtful also, all of those things that all, the whole human range, you know, with the belief that if we spend enough time with anyone and look at them with enough generosity, we will have empathy for some aspect of who they are, you know, and that's the thing that I sort of want to arrive at. That's what interests me most of how, how to get there. Um, about place, I mean, I think I've been to most places that I've written about, with the exception of like Valparaiso, which is a place in the history of love, which I just totally imagine. But when I got there, everyone said, you did, you described it so well. It was so you must have spent a lot of time here. It was just like, oh yeah, it's got a port. And that. But most places are, are, I choose because they mean something. They're vivid in my life and, and in my emotional life. And Israel is a place that, you know, it, Israel is the only place in my family for 80 years, for four generations, it's been a constant. So, you know, my great-grandparents, my grandparents, my parents, my brother, my siblings, it is the place where everyone met, married, fell in love, goes to die. I mean, we're, all my grandparents were from Europe, so, you know, after the, hol during the Holocaust, after the Holocaust, everyone was exploded to all kinds of place, places in the globe, and since then we've all been kind of coming and going, but Israel is kind of the place where the heart lies, and we sort of go, we go and come back. And so I've been going there all my life. It, it made perfect sense to me to send characters who are searching, characters who are open to this possibility of change, of transformation, to a place that has been for nearly 70 years now engaged in the act of self-invention in the most urgent, existential, complex, contradictory, violent, beautiful, difficult way. That was awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, no, it's fun. And again, you never know. It's not a random, like, we didn't, you know, <clears throat> meet each other on the internet and arrange this. Th My point is I know her and I love her work, but so many things. It resonates with me, what mm -hmm. she's saying. Even, you know, from the last thing, that's what I, like, like, even that in our heads, you know, you write a long time, and I think if you have the good fortune of coming out in front of people, you have to put things into words, but I literally call it like world's cracked open. Like the word, that would basically the word crack is like such a crazy thing to me. About, but uh, yeah, on the character things, I think that is huge to me. I mean, part of it, you know, my general, the whole, I mean, it may be the Israel part or it may be just what happens as you write and you become aware of things. But yes, this whole book, if you ask me what is the theme of my book was the exploration of empathy you know my general you know is a violent man he's, he's, you know you have to be able to enter yeah I, I don't i don't engage with it in terms of are they likable or not you're just building your world and you can't do it it's not functioning if it's not empathetic i think that's it ba back to books working for people there's certain things if you're working i always say with writers i'm like don't lend them your car don't ask them to babysit don't trust them with your girlfriend or boyfriend you know what i'm saying like terrible people in many ways on the outside, but inside, weights and measures. No, I'm saying, on the page, if they can't understand good and bad, you know, like, you know, let's not talk about what Keats, you know, the man needs to be, you know, anyway. But, uh, you know, like, personal life is separate from, but, uh, so yeah, I, I just think it, it, it all gets driven by the heart in that weird, you know, extreme, 
intense way when you're when you're building these characters. And even the, the science of other things, even hearing like Nicole read that beautiful thing, like I'm telling you, you have to know how synapses fire because I guarantee, I feel like the whole room must have been thinking when the brother goes down, I was like, he better come up with, there's like, I was so <laughs> nervous and I was like, he's gotta come up with something. Like she has her moment, but I was like, that's not a joke or an accident. Like. It's, it's, and it's not formulaic either, it's just a matter of trust. Like, I trust her and I trust you're not gonna have him come up, you owe me something, you know, <laughs> something else. But like, so yeah, I feel like all of that is about empathy with the reader too and the character. But back to Imagine Spaces, I feel like a lot of writers, you know, uh, I once, peeped, somebody like literally screamed out from the audience, I was giving a talk and I was like, I'm, I'm terribly shy. And they're like, you're not shy. And I was like, oh, I'm private. But uh, you know, but like my first story to decide to, like my first grown up story where it was about being a writer and becoming a writer, I said in a Stalinist prison in 1952. Like I always go distant and I'm moving the other way. So back, back to imagine places, like my novel, which took me a decade to write on Argentina, back to the Valparaiso thing is like, I went for a wedding and then spent years in you know, the New York Public Library. I could tell you, like I know what script they use for graffiti. I know how much topsoil is in the North. Like I made my brain, you literally map your brain until like right now, and I know I could like, you know, I read all her, I could test her, like I can see the apartment that from that book, like the way I see another apartment that I lived in, it's like, it's literally restructuring your brain. But for this one, it was a weird triangulation of imagining for me. I was like, I'm gonna use cities I know. I teach for NYU, I spend a lot of time in Paris because of that, uh, you're like hard negotiation. I'll take that job. Anyway, but the point is I work in Paris, like I've lived in Berlin for a stretch, like Jerusalem for so many years, and it was, I was like, I'm gonna use places that have, your memory changes thing, that's its own narrative. But uh, I, I did a big rewrite of this book. We spent the uh, last year mostly living in Zomba, Malawi, and it was really a gift to me to be in a place so wildly foreign. So I was both in my world that I'd imagined, and then really relying on memory, which is its own construct of a world, it's real to you, but that's you know why we have to really change our prison system. You know, Even identification is so terrifying how many innocent people are in prison. And then there I am in this, like the reality that I was in was more foreign than any of the other two that I was dealing with, and I was really thankful for that triangulation and how it helped me to like mm -hmm. request, you know what I'm saying, just even going to the store is a complication. Every, like new spaces help the old spaces. So yeah, that triangle of reality, Yes, these realities are so real that I'm saying I rewrote this book in a reality that seemed less real to me than the one in which I was working. You're like, why didn't you say that five minutes ago? <laughs> Save us all some time. I'm sorry to say we are out of time. Shocking. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Nicole Krauss and Nathan Englander. Thank you.